a coaching practice called AHA Coaching, I love that word, anyway. um, which focuses on chronic illness, stress, anxiety, wellness, and a large concentration in neuroplasticity concepts. Um, at 20, she contracted a simple case of mononucleosis. Are you going into that story? Because I won't, okay. I'm not going to give away anything on that. Uh, she does work with clients all over the world, and for the last three years, she continues to grow and evolve the practice. Uh, she's very incredibly passionate, and I have to know she is, about her work. She grew up in Madison. She currently lives in New Haven with her best friend, who's right over here. Here, it's a rescue dog named, actually I found out it's not her best best friend. <laughs> um, rescue dog named Miss Daisy. So Laura, I'll let you take over. So I spoke at the Happiness Club about three years ago and um, it was sort of the first time I kind of went public with my journey. And to be honest, it was a little bit of word vomit. Um, and it was, I think, you know, beneficial for everybody and it was definitely healing, but I reached out to Tina because that isn't as necessary at this point. And there, I will have to rehash the story to kind of get to, you to where I am now. Um, but it's a lot more of a condensed and it's more what I've taken since the years prior to that. I mean, sorry, following that. Um, and some of that's come from working with other people, my clients, that comes from, I have a Facebook coaching page, I do videos, um, people give me feedback on their own journeys, um, and continuing to evolve and learn, and, and that's why I reached out to Tina. Um, and, and Kevin back there will tell you, when I spoke three years ago, I had a piece of paper, and I was reading word for word every piece of that journey, um, and I decided we're gonna do it a little differently this time, so. I also want to let you know my PowerPoint is probably the most millennial thing I've ever done. Uh, there's a lot of slight to humorous, um, and that's a big part of what I believe in, just kind of laughter is the best medicine. Um, for my millennials in the room, there's like Instagram drawings because I was trying to make things to put in it. Is that better for you guys? Yeah. Okay. Um, and as she said, my best friend came here, Miss Daisy, because uh, she makes a lot of people very happy. She was a big part of the journey, and she went on her own little transformation journey. Um, she's a rescue dog from Arkansas, um, and I got her about nine months into the healing leg of things. Um, and she's made her rounds and said hello to a lot of you. But, um, so we have to go back to fall of 2010. Um, and just so you guys know, I will sit at a certain point. I've got a boot on right now, but um, I'm going to take you back to, to fall of 2010, it's the sophomore year of college. Um, I'm at University of Connecticut stores, and I will tell you at this point in time, everything is going brilliantly. Um, I feel like I, I'm on cloud nine, um, and so I had just studied abroad in Spain the semester before. I, I fell in love with Spain, I fell in love with culture, I stayed with the host mom, who um, has become basically second family to me. I still stay in touch with her now. Um, and I came back and I had a really specific career vision. Um, so when I had started school, I was in the business school um, and it never really felt completely right. I was interested in it, but it was kind of wanted more. Um, and my parents wanted me to think about before jumping out of it, it was competitive to get into. And so I started to try to like add a double major and it just like, I pick up one major and be like, oh, that's not quite right. And so when I came back, I kind of had this pinpoint vision. Um, and so I created my own major. We had this individualized major office at UConn. So you take a school of 20,000, now you're down to a program of about 50. Um, and I combined business, political science, economics, culture. Um, it was called International Commerce and Political Economy. And then I doubled it with Spanish. Um, and it was really, really exciting because it was basically putting together everything I loved. And I went before a committee, I had it approved, and I got to seek out faculty members to advise me on it. Um, and then I decided I really, really wanted to get involved with international students because when I had been abroad, I, I fell in love with culture. But the one thing I felt, I, was, I wished people had more interest in getting to know foreigners. Um, so I was adamant, no worries, when I was adamant that I really wanted to help exchange students, for example. So I kind of walked into the study abroad office, just kind of hoping for the best, and I was gonna volunteer. And the international exchange coordinator says to me, well, well, do you want a job? And she said, because my assistant's just uh, finished up. So 
So now I get to have a job managing international exchange students and I help her plan the orientation. We manage 100 students a semester. So within the first two weeks of school, I have friends from all over the world and I just couldn't, I couldn't be happier. And um, so we're going along and I'm also like enjoying college a little bit more. I'd been really stressed out the two years before that with just academics and I kind of let loose a little bit more and, and everything is going fabulous. And so then we hit about midterms of, of that semester. Um, and of course, people have been in college, it's a very stressful week. Um, and so I've got like four back-to-back -back midterms and then we go out Friends go out and typical college stuff, we all go out, we drink, etc. And I wake up and I don't feel that good. Um, and that was the one thing. I, I never really considered myself to have health problems in the past, but I would get sick very, very easily. I was on antibiotics constantly, I'd get worn down very easily, um, much more than my peers. And so I go to the infirmary and they say, okay, I think you have strep throat. And in the meantime, at that, at that same weekend I had uh, met another exchange student, a guy, and, and I started to get involved, and I was the first time I had liked somebody in a long time, so again, everything still seems to be going well, but this person had mono two months before. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, so between that, and now there seems to be an outbreak of mono on campus. And, and so they still tell me it's strep throat. And then somewhere along the line, I don't even quite remember when, but I wake up one morning, I, I can't even really walk on my right foot. And so I had always been taught you sort of just push through pain. So I uh, figured it was like a pulled muscle or something and I wrapped it up and I got on a treadmill and I ran two miles at six o'clock in the morning and about a mile in, I'm like, I, I couldn't even do it anymore. So I got off the treadmill. Um, but back in that day, wearing sneakers with like my cute outfits and my tiny little world was like the death of me and I wasn't gonna do it. So I still had to wear my normal shoes. So I remember I, look back at that and cringe because I would go out in heels and, and all this stuff and I'm limping more and more every day. And I go back to the infirmary and I think now we're on round two of antibiotics and I happen to mention, I'm like, oh, by the way, I, I can't really walk. And, and so they x-ray it and they're like, this is a really bad stress fracture. <coughs> and um, at the same time, that nurse practitioner says, I'm gonna test you for mono. And in the meantime, so this, this month is starting to kind of like unravel a bit. And, and that guy that I'm involved with, he was going home in two months. And so we were starting to fall apart because he said, well, of course I don't want anything, I'm leaving. And I'll talk about internal belief systems. Well, I made it a much bigger deal because I looked for rejection and everything. So I made this big story out of it and took it really hard. And um, I remember the day when I got the call that I had mono. And so it was like, I got this foot, I'm kind of looking around, I get this call, I have mono, and I remember reaching out to that person and saying, well, gee, thanks. <laughs> and, uh, and it was then Saturday night at college, and so everybody's out, everybody's enjoying themselves. And I lived in an off-campus place, my roommate's out, and I remember that night specifically, because it's kind of when things started to change. And I'm stuck in bed, I'm sleeping like 12 hours a night at this point, I'm stuck in bed and I remember feeling so alone and I was just like, what is happening? Um, and then it was sort of like he and I had our last texting conversation, it was very clear, it was just cutting off and I just remember like, okay, what, what's happening? And I'm not going to go into every day, if I tell you every detail, I did that once before, we'll be here forever, but my health just continues to decline from there on out. Um, so every time I go through something, I'm never really quite recovering. So I go ahead and get my tonsils out two months later. I go in on antibiotics with a sinus infection. Next thing that happens, my hormones plummet. I'm going through menopause symptoms, but I didn't know what they were. Um, and so my periods have stopped. I'm having symptom after symptom. And in the meantime, I'm getting bounced from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And nobody really knows what's going on. Just, we're going to try this. We're going to try this. We're going to try this. And so we get to the summer of 2011 and I intern in New York um, at a full-time position. And I will tell you, it's the summer of 2011 was sort of the last marker of when I was able to hold down a full-time job. It was the last time I really was able to work 40 hours a week. And it was a struggle. I was in a boot back then too. I spent most of my 20s in a boot. Um, and I got through it, but then I had surgery on that foot. And I will tell you, that was the next kind of straw that was starting to break the camel's back. I, I didn't have the same stamina after that. I, I got really worn down really fast. I, I was just exhausted very easily. And we still don't have answers. And I remember we go, it was two days into the first semester of senior year, and I'm crutching around in a hard cast. And I uh, would go up to each professor and try to tell them like what's going on so they were a little bit prepared. And I remember, I think it was professor three I hit, and I started 
crying hysterically before I could even finish the statement. And I, and I called my mother and I said, I, I can't do this. Um, so I then met with the, the, I don't remember who it was, the dean of something or other, and I say, you know, we need to make some changes. And I remember too, I still use my humor back then, she uh, said, sorry, I'm, going, I'm having a hot flash right now, she's going through menopause, and I said, oh, I know all about that. And um, it was in that moment she said, okay, we're, we're gonna make this work. So I, I dropped to part-time and I had Mondays and Fridays off. So I would come home most of the weekends and we had this mentality, okay, some doctor will figure it out in the next semester, you know. I had always known the medical model as you go to a doctor, they know what's wrong with you, they give you a pill. I did not know of anything else. Um, I had never experienced anything else. So it was just like, of course, if I'm gonna spend three months going to doctors, somebody's gonna have an answer. Um, and so in the meantime, I'm, I'm getting by. Um, I start doing other things, I start taking supplements and vitamins, I start going in the integrative world, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm getting slapped with millions of diagnoses. Uh, and then I was supposed to intern abroad that last semester. In South America and I, I it took me so long to finally concede it wasn't gonna happen I don't think I finally accepted it until probably January um, and I was kind of clear I'm not going to South America and uh, at that point I was kind of feeling like okay I've done this long enough like I've been sick long enough like that's enough like let's let's get on with life <laughs> like and um, so I am doing okay, I can function, and I was home. I, I was, because I had been a little bit ahead, I got to do two independent studies from home. And I would manage a couple little like babysitting jobs and, and things like that, but I would hit these periods where I, I couldn't get out of bed for a few days. But then they would pass, um, and so I was, I was doing a lot of holistic stuff, getting into holistic therapies, and, and then we hit May of, I graduated, and we hit May of 2012. And, and this is what will always be the last straw that broke the camel's back. Um, I went to Newport with my best friend for the day, and I think we were both really excited to have a more normal day. Um, and I ate with her some smoked trout, I will never forget that. <laughs> and we're, we're driving home, and I remember it was just like this fog I couldn't even explain. Like it was just like, I, I was dizzy, I was foggy, I could barely see straight. And we get home, and I basically almost crawl into bed. And, and I felt like my body was shutting down. I had never felt like that in my entire life. And I remember I was whimpering all night. She kept asking me, are you in pain, are you in pain? I didn't even know how to answer it because it was some sort of pain, but it wasn't actual physical pain. It was like suffering pain. And um, I was in and out of sleep that whole night. And then I remember I tried to turn over and it felt like literally on the cellular level, it was like asking my body to deadlift 400 pounds. Like it was, I couldn't do it. And so finally at five o'clock in the morning, I get up and I, I throw up. So I figured, okay, it's food poisoning. However, it was sort of food poisoning that was just sort of the last stressor on that body. And um, I couldn't move from the bed for, for two days. Um, I, I was able to walk to the bathroom, but that was about it. And long story short, with a lot of intervention, we find a doctor in, in New York City um, who specialized in something called chronic fatigue syndrome. And I had been tossed around that diagnosis before, and I thought it was just a quote unquote BS diagnosis for we don't know what's wrong with you. And uh, then I learned I, when I started entering this world, it was a whole nother world. Um, I do a lot of advocacy for it. I learned there's two million people walking around with it. There's not one FDA approved treatment. So when you get this diagnosis, nobody really knows what to do with you. Um, and so I started for the next two years, I started every treatment you can imagine. So I'm talking, we've, I was doing vitamin IVs, vitamin shots. I was doing immunoglobulin shots called gamma globulin. They use them in the army. Um, I did antivirals, antibiotics, uh, intensive psychotherapy, body work. Uh, I saw shamans. I, I mean, you name it, it was done. And they all led to where I am today. You know, I had great experiences in, in some of it. And some of them would help me for a little bit and then i just go right back down. So now we're, so let's fast forward two years later with just rapid deterioration. And I am in Florida with uh, my father. My family used to have a place in Florida. So we went down for the winter because we thought the weather would help. And um, so I went down, I was definitely very limited at this point. I needed help with basic things like cooking, but I could physically walk. Uh, but by the time I left, I could no longer do that and was completely bedridden and had 24 hour care um, and I had to be medevaced home on a medical plane. Um, so I get home and I'm admitted to, to Yale and I've spent four days there and they literally basically say to go home and eat. Um, and 
I go home and within those next two months, I waist down to 79 pounds. Um, and at this point, uh, my psychiatric state has also flown out the window. I have severe depression at this point. Um, very, very anxious about everything that's happening. And on top of it, so I, I'm a little bit irrational at this point. Um, and I said, at this point, my whole body's falling apart. So I have like severe GI distress. So now I'm terrified to eat food. Um, and I keep saying, what's happened to my life? What's happened to my life? And it was like, I will talk about sort of this concept of spiritual bypass. I'd say the first year I was sick, I was reading all the spiritual stuff. And I would be like, oh, okay, everything's gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be fine. And so what happened was, because I never really processed it, it exploded in my face. And all I would do is just go into these moments and then I would go numb, but I would start crying hysterically and say, how did I get here? How did I get here? How did I get here? So I made it to Middlesex in, in August of 2014. And um, they insist that I need a, a G-tube. So that's a tube in your stomach and they feed you liquid through it. Um, and I remember kind of arguing with them, well, that was why I was, anything going through my stomach, I was afraid of eating because of the horrible GI distress. But in a traditional medical model, I wasn't projectile vomiting and it wasn't coming out the other end. So in that model, that it means you're tolerating it. So they don't really care otherwise. But we put the, we put the G-tube in and they tell me I'm gonna go home in two days. So even my, my family goes up to a place in upstate New York and I'm thinking I'm going home in two days. But like I thought, when they start this G-tube, I can't really tolerate the formula. And so I, I, I'm crying hysterically from the pain. Um, and at this point, they just think I'm a wacko. And, um, and you know, I'm dealing with a dog, uh, specifically this internist who, if you read the notes, just didn't believe chronic fatigue syndrome was a real thing. And, and basically, I was a psychiatric patient, end of story. And so we can't get this tube speed um, up to speed. But I still, like, nobody's telling me anything's going to change. And then the next morning, they have a new internist as they switch the rounds. And he comes flying in. And, and he says to me, I need to put a pick line in you immediately. And that's an, uh, an IV. And they'll feed you through that. And he said, because your organs are shutting down. And he said, otherwise, I need to send you to hospice. Because that's the situation we're looking at. And I remember I said to him, but I, but I thought I was going home. I thought I was going home. And, and of course, I said, sure, I agreed. And, and I, I can't imagine what the phone call was like for my family. And um, I remember, so the a few days before that, I had, this is sort of the first time I started talking about it, I, I had a near-death experience. And I've had really a big interest in them. I have kind of studied them since then. I've talked to probably 20 people that have had them. I've read different books on them. And what I find so, so interesting is while everybody's near-death experience is different, there are many, it's just this similar theme across the board, and it's just sort of this feeling that's kind of inexplicable when words here. And it changed my perception with death dramatically in a very good way, and, and it affects me to this day. And I remember, though, when I had that experience, I, I made the decision to stay. And I remember thinking in all these moments, why did I ever do that? Because I was just in so much suffering. Um, and so even though I was facing death at that point, I kind of feel like I had already made that decision before. Um, and so I remember they, they bring a nurse in to, to do the pick line. And I remember she starts hitting me. And, and you know, it's because I had my heart rate spikes. I don't even remember what happened. And I remember I couldn't really even answer. It was like I was almost not quite there. And she panics. She hits the call button. People come in. And so they got to bring in an interventional radiologist on a Saturday morning, and I remember them all watching in the OR room as he, as he gets it in. And, um, and then I started to process it in small bits. It's kind of like when you go through something like that, you put this poker face on. I've been crying about everything else, but in that moment, somehow you just get through. And I would say in small bits, I'm like, oh, I almost died, I almost died, and I'd cry, and then I'd stop. And um, so we get this two feet up, and in the meantime, I've been slapped with diagnoses such as anorexia, um, you know, I'm sure they would have wanted to just put flat out crazy on the piece of paper. Um, and I remember feeling so unheard, not believed, but at the same time, I was pretty difficult back then. I was pretty irrational at this point. I was deemed rational, I don't know how. And um, I want to thank somebody in here, Kathy. She was doing Reiki at the Middlesex Hospital, and it was the only thing I looked forward to every single day. And I would just, like, every day I would get through because I was gonna have some Reiki done. It was like the only moment of peace I had. And um, then I get transferred to this hospital in New Britain, a rehab hospital. So I've spent five weeks in hospitals now. I'm now up to 82 pounds. And um, my insurance has cut. And so I will talk about rock bottom. 
And I thought this was the rock bottom. Um, I don't know how you could go below rock bottom at this point. I cannot feed myself. I have a commode because I cannot walk to a bathroom. I can barely wipe my own butt after I go to the bathroom. I um, have no money to my name. I had drained, we had found out the account had been drained paying all these medical bills somewhere along the line. So it's like, while I might have had rights, I don't know how you really have much choice or rights when you cannot take care of yourself. And then my parents came in and, and said, you're either going, at this point, all they cared about was my psychiatric health. They wanted the depression taken care of, the anxiety taken care of, and they had to, as their point of view, I had to gain weight and I had to get over the fear of the symptoms in the food. And so they basically said, you're either going to a psych ward or you're going to an eating disorder facility. And I remember I flipped out. And I was basically like, well, one, I was, a, I'm not going to a psych ward, that's what I said. But two, I was really adamant. I didn't want to go to an eating disorder facility because I had this picture in my head of, this is what I literally said out loud. I said, I don't want to be around people who are starving themselves on purpose. I wanted to gain weight more than anything. I was traumatized by the way I looked at 79 pounds. I looked like a concentration camp survivor. Um, I said, you know, these people are just choosing not to eat. I didn't really understand, you know, I, I didn't have a ton of compassion towards eating disorders, to be honest. I said, these people are just choosing not to eat. I, I want to eat more than anything, you know, et cetera. And, um, but what choice to me, it was what choice did I have? And, and my mother said, and she was right, she said, you will die in a nursing home. And, and so the next day I was on another medivac to Arizona. There was only two facilities in the country that would take somebody that medically compromised and on a G2. And um, so I'm taking an ambulance ride up, up to this facility. I am in the middle of nowhere. I kind of make jokes when um, people tell me they're from Arizona. And I'm like, oh, I've been to Wickenburg, Arizona. Um, and so when I, when I get up there and they, they take me off this, you know, they have me the stretcher. And uh, I go in and I remember I said to mom, you can't leave me here. You can't leave me here. I'm not like these people. You can't leave me here. And um, I was terrified. I've never seen a place like this. There are very sick people there. Um, and I, you know, well, it was too bad I was going to be there. And so the first day or two, I was like, okay, I was optimistic. Maybe people will listen to me. Maybe people will believe me this time. But the problem is in addictions, one of the kind of primary facets, there's a lot of lying and manipulation that goes on. It's part of addictions. It's part of the disease. So in there, everybody's treated like a liar. So anything I said was just basically treated as BS. So when I talked about... Um, I had this bladder disease that would have been diagnosed and that is managed, you know, Yale standards by a non-acidic diet. I mean, they just blew me off, blew me off, blew me off. And that internist was convinced that, of course, I had chronic fatigue syndrome. I wasn't eating. I tried to explain, yes, this was here way before that. Um, and she kind of blew me off with everything I said. And um, so I shut down even more. When I realized nobody was believing me, I shut down. And, and then I almost got defiant. I just, I wouldn't, at that point, I just was kind of defiant. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't do anything. And I remember we are getting to another rock bottom. I thought I'd already hit rock bottom, now we're at another rock bottom, because it was this realization, at least at home, I had family and friends who still believed me. Um, and so in there, I was seeing basically the difference of some people with a classical eating disorder with no other chronic illness on top. When they are at that weight, there were plenty of people at that weight, they're still trying to burn calories. They're still functional. How, so when I'm in this bed and can't even like roll over, they thought I was full of shit, and that is the word I'm going to use. Um, so they just thought I was basically making it up, I wanted attention, um, and they thought I was just a spoiled brat who didn't want to do anything. So, and then on the meantime, um, so along this way, I, by the way, guys, I got a diagnosis of osteoporosis during my journey, way before the bed mount and all that stuff. So I was complaining about my foot when I was transferring from the bed to the, uh, to the wheelchair. And when they got me in the wheelchair, sitting in that wheelchair was the hardest thing I've probably ever done in my entire life, just to sit in a wheelchair. And to everybody else, I would be mocked. And you know, it was basically like, oh, you must be so tired sitting in that wheelchair. And that foot pain they thought was basically another Priya. So sometimes we'd be at the table and some of them would kick my foot to, to try to make a point. And, and I, again, but I was mute. I wouldn't, I wouldn't engage with anybody. And um, so now I've hit the lowest of all lows. And I want to die more than I've ever wanted to die in my entire life. And um, so I, but I was still mute and I was thinking, I'm in a facility where you cannot have dental floss, you cannot have mouthwash, you cannot have, 
We didn't have cell phones. You can't have razors. So in my head, I'm trying to come up with creative ways of how that could happen. So I'm thinking if they like put the wheelchair sort of near the mountain, like we're in the middle of nowhere, guys, in the desert, in the Sonoran Desert, that maybe like they put me close enough and I could like somehow get it to like go and then I'd fall off the mountain. That was the only thing I could come up with. But um, that wasn't very realistic. And I finally, uh, one of the techs, I had a one-on-one -on -one tech because I couldn't take care of myself. And, so she said to me, I had a card on the bulletin board and it, it said, be kind, be true, be you. And she reads that out loud and she says, ha ha ha, be kind, be true, be you. Isn't that funny, Laura? And I looked her square in the eyes and it's the first time I spoke in a while. And I said, you want the truth? I said, I just want to die. And so she went off and she got the psychiatrist, as would be protocol. And the psychiatrist comes in and says, are you suicidal? And I wanted to say no, but she's standing right there and I just said four minutes before I wanted to die. So I just say yes. And she says, do you have a plan? And I almost laughed in that moment, even under that. And I said, how would I? Like, you know, given the condition I was in. And I will say to you, that was my point of full, full surrender. And I realized it was out of my hands now. And what I had been doing for the last few years hadn't worked. And I had fought medication very, very hard. I had very bad reactions to meds during all this. I also had this kind of idea like, well, the depression is so clearly from the illness, so why would I take medication? Um, and it was the first time, so when they, they started asking me questions, and I was already started on one medication at this point, she said, you know, I'm gonna put you on this antidepressant. I just said, do whatever you want. And it was the best moment that could have happened to me. There was another moment that came out of that, but she started, and normally meds don't work that fast, but I would say within four or five days, I just remember this feeling of, okay, I'm still very, very sick, but I, I don't wanna die. Um, you know, and it was like, I'm still in a wheelchair, I'm still limited, people are still taking care, like, you know, helping me shower and stuff, but it was this feeling of maybe I don't want to die. And then they got a new psychiatrist on staff, and that was the next turning point because it was the first person who believed me. And to have somebody believe me made me trust somebody again. And, and she said to me, the first thing she said, I never doubted your eating issues were secondary to everything else. Um, and she admitted to me over time she had fibromyalgia and and so we connected on that and she said do you know what it's like to have fibromyalgia in the psychiatry world um, and so she she worked with me and I, I had an extra rest time during the day um, we, we still kind of bumped heads sometimes she didn't think I like she thought I should be able to walk and I just let her think whatever she wanted um, and she would work with me too on, on people's disbelief and she went she made the dietitian listen to me more so they, they got me off these like citrus and acidic foods because i was having incontinence at that point and so they worked with me a bit more and so i started to open up to other people as well and one of the things that came out of there and it's used in my career to this day is i learned a lot about the human experience we would have group therapy every day and how i had walked in there and just thought people were starving themselves because they want to be thin I learned it's so much more complicated than that. And I went in there originally thinking, I couldn't really wrap my head around why would you make that choice when I felt like I had this physical illness that was out of my choice. And I thought to myself, if you just eat, you could have your entire life back. And I realized how much more complex it is than that. And I remember walking out of there and said, you know what, I'd rather take a physical, I'd rather take this illness than an addiction. Because I heard so much suffering. And that's where I realized in that group therapy, what we all have in common is suffering and joy and experience and life experience and, and so it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from we all have that in common and i will tell you you know i met some, i met so there were some people that you know they never going to believe me and that's fine and some people who were very sick and i met some people who did who did trust me and believe me and, and that was a great experience and um i will tell you you know i i changed my perception of, of eating disorders completely um and two of my friends from that program are, are no longer alive to this day um, because of, of complications of their eating disorders. Um, and so I remember the, the, the last pivotal moment, so I, I learned that. Um, and then the, one of the other big pivotal moments was sort of the turning point in that journey. Um, and I was sitting in the wheelchair. I was in the wheelchair the entire time I was there. And um, I couldn't really do much and everybody was doing activities. So somebody was playing horseshoes and um, I just was sitting there watching, and I had this epiphany that I was happy. You know, it was just this, the sun was beating down, we're like, we do have this pretty desert view, I have to say, and it was the first time I realized I can still be happy. I can be in a wheelchair and still be happy. And, and I had spent the last four years, and I see this with client after client who deals with, with, with illnesses, 
that they cannot be happy until their problems go away. And it doesn't have to be a physical illness. A lot of people have that mentality. And so whatever their suffering is goes away, they can't be happy. And it was the first time I realized in that moment I could still find meaning in life. And, and I will always say it was sort of the pivotal point. Um, and so then I go home on December 22nd, 2014. I never forgot that date. I was in there for approximately 10 weeks. Um, they would laugh at me in there because I had, we didn't have calendars, I just kept it up here. And um, my father came and picked me up. So I had been many backed out there and I came home on a commercial airline in a wheelchair. Um, and from there on out was the pivotal point. And, and you know, we don't need to get into some of that. We, I went on, I found a doctor in New York. Um, he, he treated some uh, chronic infections. I've done antibiotics, I've done antivirus. Um, and, and that made a difference, it was slowly. It was a slow journey, just day by day I got a little bit stronger. I got out of that wheelchair fully by that summer, summer of 15. And um, I also got into something called neuroplasticity programs. They're called brain retraining programs and I, it became one of my big, big interests. And basically it talks about in chronic illnesses, the brain, the brain being plastic can be used to our advantage and it can be used to our disadvantage, can get rewired. And so what happens is it often gets stuck in a lot of these chronic illness loops. And, um, and so it starts to feed off each other. And so it was these self done programs at home. And I started, I loved the topic. I found it fascinating. Um, and there's more and more and more coming out about neuroplasticity. So that'll be a wheel been in here at times. Um, and, and so then it, it went on from there and, and to this day, um, there's still ups and downs. And that's why we're gonna talk about this is my great artwork, everybody, but <laughs> on the left, this is always what I thought healing was. When I thought people said you, you heal and transform, I, I thought it was this, this beautiful upward line with roses and yoga and stars and prettiness. And then I realized that's really a lot more what healing and transformation looks like, whatever it's from. Um, so we have some tornadoes in there, we have some thunderstorms, we have a wilted flower and then a beautiful flower and some sun. And that there's a lot of downwards, but what I think you might notice is the down never goes quite as low as you once were. It can still go pretty low, but it never goes as low as you once were. And overall, we're going in an upward trajectory. Nobody really talks about this. People talk about it because when you hear all these like transformation stories, that's why I started to change my coaching approach. I saw, I have a lot of friends that are coaches and it's like, oh, I, I did this treatment and um, I was climbing a mountain in three months. And I would look at my journey, I'm like, what, what's going on? What, what's wrong with me? Like, what, what am I doing wrong? And if, by the way, if you talk to those people more in depth, it, it wasn't just like, oh, they were running two miles one day and three miles the day. No, no, there's a lot more to it. So I realized this is something that tends to be missing when we talk about healing and transformation. Um, and so I will tell you too, like during, for my reality, where I am today, um, I have been able to, I've traveled to six countries. I've been on three different continents, those trips have been super successful, some have been, um, there have been periods where I'm not that functional and then there's been periods I just finished a full time grad program year um, and I have learned how to dance bachata and salsa. I picked my second language back up. Um, I have a social life and then what happens is, is sometimes that is more up here and sometimes it's flowing with the ebbs and flows and sometimes all of that's a little bit down here. Um, so, we're going to go into step one. I don't really like steps though, I will have to say it's kind of fluid, but we can, uh, so, yes, my millennials, I've used memes this whole time, so. Um, this is one thing I, I talk about, is, is surrender. And I, I get a lot of questions of, how do I surrender? And as soon as you're saying how, you're kind of out of the whole concept of, of surrender. And um, another thing I want to clarify is that surrender, is often associated with defeat because we often talk about surrender in battle, right? That's when we use that term a lot, they surrender in battle. Um, and so people assume, okay, if I surrender, I'm, I'm giving up. And it's so far from that. And the way I decided to define it is, is starting to trust the unknown or trust ambiguity. And, and there are going to be times where you don't know what the next step is and it's surrendering to that. Um, and so I had talked three years ago, like I said, and I came in here and a lot of my talks from back then, surrender, acceptance, and gratitude, it was just the three things. And I, I really wanted to do something different. I thought about it and I realized like you can't delete this step, unfortunately. Um, and this is more if 
what she, like what I was saying basically, my, my father gave me this quote many times, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I say this is for when what you've been doing hasn't been working, your way is no longer working. Um, and so that's a big thing to, to kind of come to terms with and that's why I say, I hit that point in rehab and it took what, two different rock bottoms to finally say, okay, my way isn't working anymore. And it's kind of like, I'm gonna surrender to, I don't know what the next step is for once. I don't know, I don't have the control anymore and I'm gonna trust somebody else, I'm gonna trust this plan. Um, and so I would say a lot of people are, are afraid of this because we love control as human beings. Um, I say control is an illusion, but we love to try to control every little thing in life. Um, so this cat is a great little picture for you. But so the next thing is learning to sit with pain. And I think this is something, especially in this culture in particular, is something we are never really taught to do. <clears throat> so what happens is when we can't sit with pain, we are running from the first sign of discomfort at all costs. And so what do we do, I mean, I love this here. Um, what do we do when we're sad? Some of us will go shopping until we're broke. Some of us will numb out with substances. Some of us will be workaholic. Some of us will overfill our schedule. Some of us, and sometimes, yes, we need temporary coping mechanisms, right? Sometimes we do need to numb out, but when we are running from our pain at all costs and never ever learning to sit with it, by the way, you can do that for a while, but the body takes that on eventually. Just because it might not be up here, the body starts to live that. Um, and, and so, you know, I started to see that. I made a video in, in my coaching practices. Are you addicted to healing? That goes for transformation. Because I would, I would get these clients and I was the same exact way. And it's always the next treatment. It's the next best thing. It's the next healer, the next pill, the next supplement, the next diet, the next whatever. And I finally couldn't realize until I was writing this speech, it's the same issue of running from our pain. And it's a very hard concept to get because in this culture, we are taught not to be in pain. We are taught to avoid pain at all costs. And so, what I realized too is we also, we struggle to sit with others' pain, and I liked this one, um, and you could just replace depression with sadness, and that's the one I found, but I couldn't copy it, but when you suffer from depression and somebody tells you to just cheer up, my goodness, what an idea, why didn't I think of that? And so, that is, and what I realized is, you know, I, I have experienced that. I, I, I definitely have an interest in kind of advocating for a little bit more of the disability world as I'm quote unquote not fully able-bodied even today. And I, people will tell you in this world all the time, and I think that's anybody who's dealing with a mental or physical health issue, that people are very uncomfortable with your suffering. Um, and so if you say something like, I'm sick, people are like, mm -hmm. And it makes sense because we don't know how to sit with our own pain, so how would we be able to sit with anybody else's pain? And it took me a long time to realize one of the best things you can do for somebody, I used to be somebody too who wanted to fix everybody's pain, so if somebody was in pain, it was like cheer them up, try to make them better, try to help them, and it took me a long time, and some of that's just from being in a, as a coach now, is sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody is sit with them while they're in their pain and to hold that space for them. And what I realized is, of course, we don't know how to do that because we don't know how to do that for ourselves. And, and so, you know, of course, I will say there's a difference between chronic complaining um, and there'll be a difference between being stuck. And, and you will know the difference. It will feel very different to you. When, when somebody comes to you and is truly in pain and expressing that versus when they're just chronically complaining about the same problem. And by the way, normally if they are, they aren't really feeling the actual pain underneath that. Um, but... You know, this is common. How many of us, when somebody's sad, what do we normally say? Like, oh, cheer up, you're gonna be okay. Um, and so when we learn to sit with our own pain, will it be, oh, we can also learn to sit with other people's pain. Now, <laughs> this goes into when you can learn to sit with your pain. And by the way, so I go to different conferences that still are based on neuroplasticity. And one of them was on chronic pain. And one of the exercises they, had, they do is called tracking. And so these are people with all sorts of unexplained medical pain conditions, uh, symptoms, whatever it may be. And one of the first exercises they will do with people that are trained in this is having them sit with the pain while somebody's with them 
and changing the response to it. So creating a relaxation response because normally what do we all do when we're in pain? We tense and that just creates more stress. And so that's a big thing that goes on is internal stress. So sometimes it's not a conscious thing. So I always talk about acceptance and this is a lot of the reaction I get from people. And I know I was this way because it's like, oh my God, if I accept this, it means like I, I'm saying, oh, this is okay to be sick, for example. So I remember I was in therapy early on and I had a therapist say to me, Laura, are you ready? It was 2013 and she said, are you ready to accept this illness? And I started sobbing hysterically. And said, but I couldn't do it. I absolutely couldn't do it. Because it was too terrifying. And I thought that meant like, okay, then I'm stuck. And it's just saying, I'm gonna live like this for the rest of my life. And I didn't realize that you cannot go forward until you've accepted where you are in the current moment. And that goes for anything. Physical illness, you know, just a, a difficult time period, emotional pain, whatever it may be. And the, the true change is when you accept what is in the moment. And that doesn't mean you might want, to, of course, you might want to make something different and that's good, you wanna be proactive, you wanna make changes. And why I talk about acceptance being so important is what you resist persists. I love that quote. And so what I say is when you don't accept the moment, you are in resistance. And I will say to you, what happens like, basically, I want you to feel this, because I can tell you how it feels in my body when I say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to feel that. My whole stomach tenses up when I say that. I can feel tension up here. I can feel the stress in my body. So even if you don't really consciously realize you're doing it, you are setting off a gazillion amounts of stress chemicals pretty much 24 hours a day. A body cannot heal when it is in a chronic stress response. And that is one of my biggest focuses in my practice is getting the body out of a chronic stress response. And a lot of people say, I'm not stressed. And I say, what about the unconscious stress? And this is a very good example of unconscious stress. So when you accept what is, you give up that resistance. So you can say, I don't really like where I am, but I'm going to accept where I am at this moment. This is where I am in this current moment. Um, and what part of that too is when you can do that, then you can start to see a little bit more clear. Because I will tell you, I lived always for the future. It was always when I'm better, I can do this. And when I'm better, I'll be happy. And when I'm better, I'll have this life. And when I'm better, when I'm better, when I'm better. And I remember this eye opening as we were five years in, and I'm still saying the same thing. And then when I finally learned to accept, which was in that wheelchair playing horseshoes, um, I finally learned I can focus on what I can do in this current moment. And so sometimes I, I will say to somebody, it's the basics. It, it's like, it might be, you're gonna watch a bird outside your window. It might be um, coloring, you know, people that are really, I mean, it might be coloring for one minute. Um, for people that are in a different part of the journey, it just depends on where you're on in the journey. So that's very, very individual for each person. But it's trying to find what you can do in the moment. And some of what helps to do that is a gratitude journal too. And I think Tina did mention that. Um, I, I, I know it's getting tossed around constantly in today's age, but it is sort of starting to see when you can spend a minute at the end of the day and write three things down that you enjoyed that day, you'll get to start to see a little bit differently. What are the things I can do in this moment? Um, this is my other theme. Um, can we click the link? I'm not the most tech savvy guy, so I'm working on this. No. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> you'll have to click it in the view because it won't. But basically, all right, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> so, um, I was in a cast for the for the first three weeks, and, and so that'll go back to, I still learn the same lessons over and over and over again. I will tell you when I booked this, no, yeah, okay. When I booked this with, with Tina back in the spring, we chose the summer because I was going to be full time in the fall and I was going to be interning. Um, and I also, I thought I would be sitting here after I had just gotten back from a 10 day trip in Spain and I thought I'd be all tan and have some pretty pictures up in Spain to tell you about. And um, I also had planned this summer, I was going to ride a horse again, um, and I was going to do a dance routine with somebody who teaches dance. I used to dance when I was younger. And I wanted to go to the turf and hit some field hockey balls because I did that when I was younger. And I will tell you, none of that happened. <laughs> um, and I was, I was in the house most of the summer. And, and so all of these lessons are still go, and, and I had to learn this one big time. And, and so, you know, in June, 
I had just come off a really rigorous academic year, and um, we started straight into the summer intensive. We had, we had two classes that are semesters worth done in one month. And I, I got a, a virus, Pray Meiji P, who's here by the way, and um, I got a virus that had been going around, but I, I still do go down pretty hard from viruses. And so I got this virus, it was pretty unpleasant. I, I was on this breath diet for a couple weeks and I was exhausted and I'm trying to go to class. These classes are four to, four to six hours and I can't keep up, I'm just getting sicker from doing that. So now I'm just getting overwhelmed and now we're just going into a depression from it. And I was able, I was good about the surrender part originally when they said, okay, I don't know why this is happening, but something will come out of this. And that's what surrendering is about, is when you hit a hard time, you might not like it, but it's just trusting. I don't know what the message is now. I don't know what the big picture is right now, but it's trusting something eventually will reveal itself. And so I was pretty good about that. And I, I decided to make all these changes and, and I finally made the decision I needed to go to part time in the fall. And then I had to do that against my ego. And it was not an easy decision, but I realized this, it was too much. I was gonna be interning and we had classes on top of it. So I made that decision and I felt all proud of myself and thought I had taken all these changes out of it. And then um, about 10 days before I'm leaving for Spain, I hit my ankle on a chair in the kitchen and I fractured my ankle. And, um, but I, I, you know, instead of saying like I just taught you, I'm gonna surrender it and see, you know, what's gonna happen. No, I was going to Spain, guys. I said, I'm going to Spain. And um, so I, I go through that week and I'm in a hard cast. He's like, all right, I'll put you in a hard cast. I'll take you out right before you leave. We'll put you in a boot. I don't think you really liked the idea, but, um, and then I had a knee scooter. I rented or somebody gave one to me and um, a family member took the screw out when they put it in the car and I did not know that. So when we, my mother drops me off in the street with the knee scooter and drives away, I'm in front of the Madison movie theater in route one. I go to ride the knee scooter. Well, that screw is its entire stability. And I topple over into the concrete. And um, so there I'm laying in the concrete. I'm terrified, by the way. And uh, my knee is all, I'm focused on the knee. It's all black and blue and cut up. But the next thing I know, my, my shin is starting to go like this over a couple hours. I have a picture of this nice big bump. And by that night, I can't really walk at all. And um, it was my opposite leg. So now I can't really walk. And I, I still was sort of like, oh, maybe I'll go to Spain, guys. And um, <laughs> I went to the orthopedic and, and he was like, um, no, you're not going to Spain. And, and luckily it was just a bad bone bruise, but it's still, I was on bed rest for a week and, and it took time and I, I had to learn this. And I had a friend come stay with me. I was in a hard cast. I had used the shower chair and getting out was, I had, both legs were kind of shot. And she said, Laura, is it, is it hard for you to accept help? And I had to really think about it. And I'm somebody who had to be dependent on people to survive at one point. And, and I thought about it and I was like, yeah, I guess it is. Um, and you know, I was willing to ask for help with things less vulnerable, like we had a mouse in the kitchen. I'm willing to ask everybody for help to catch Mr. Mouse, okay? <coughs> but, but to ask for help trying to get out of the shower chair or you know, watching people while they're like cleaning up in the kitchen, I'm just sitting there. And there was a lot of like, Laura, sit down. What are you doing? Laura, stop that. What are you doing? Please stop that. I will help you. And Finally, I got more comfortable with taking in help. And then I realized this theme started appearing everywhere in my life with other people. And I realized over and over again, that was the post I was gonna share with you. You know, we all do this in life. So I had one friend who was on a work trip and really needed to, to take time. She was going back to back to back with, with social events for work and she really needed to take some time for herself. She was worn out and she felt horrible doing it. She was terrified to say, to her team, I need to take a night off. And I had another friend say to me, who's going through a lot of like transitions, I don't think I could, basically she was saying, I don't, I don't, it's hard for me to accept help for going to therapy. And I say, we all do this, you know, whether it's uh, life transitions and we don't really wanna take in help, whether it's we're repeating relationship patterns and we don't really wanna change them, um, you know, whether it's, okay, everybody else, I can help them, but I'm not gonna take in help for myself. It's a very, very common theme. And so when I changed the quote was, we all say, oh, it's okay to ask for help. That, that's fine, I think we're all somewhat decent at that. I see that a lot, like a client will reach out and they will say, you know, they'll ask for help and then they almost take it back. I see a lot of us do that, right? We reach out and we'll say we're having a bad day and then we're like, okay, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's learning how to accept help. And I liked this little, what, what do you call these memes? Um, and a lot of us do that, you know? And we're kind of ingrained to, to keep our pride and 
to avoid help, and, and we're kind of proud of that. Um, and, and so one of the things I would say is, one of the things I took out of it, I always talk about is your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. So it's the beliefs we're carrying, you will see, because what you do is you seek out subconsciously experiences that validate that. So a lot of us have a belief system, nobody's gonna help me anyways, I hear this one a lot, I, I've said it before, if I don't do it, nobody else will. Um, I've heard, you know, what do we all say? Or it's like, oh, I reach out for help and nobody's there anyways, whatever it may be. And the thing is, the brain's really good at, at finding experiences to validate what we think. So that's all you're gonna see. And I can tell you, when I started to shift that internal belief of it's okay to ask for help, people came out of the woodwork. And I will say, yes, when you go through heavy, like hard experiences that are uncomfortable, I definitely, I watched some friends disappear during this last three months. But then people I didn't even expect came out of the woodwork to help. And I also, I had to work on my own belief. I've had to heal my belief with the medical system, for example. And as I started to say, okay, there is help out there. Um, one of my clients, doctors, we're still trying to figure out this whole own piece, endocrine piece. She got me in, she got me into her colleague up at Beth Israel who wasn't taking new patients and she made a phone call and got me in in two weeks. And I remember in that moment thinking, wow, when you shift your internal beliefs, what shows up externally is gonna look a lot different. So that's another common theme. And um, so part of change, there, there's two things I wanna talk about. Um, so one of my favorite, cause we're talking about some techniques too. One of my favorite techniques is visualization. Um, who visualizes in here? Okay. So it's funny is um, we actually all are visualizing constantly, whether we realize it or not. Um, so we're always kind of projecting an image of what we think and, and all of that. It's kind of run by, by these internal beliefs. And um, what is so powerful about visualization for making change is, um, who's heard that athletes will practice foul shots using visualization? Has anybody heard about that? And it's just as effective, you know, as learning a skill can be just, visualizing can be almost just as effective as actually doing the skill. Um, so the same regions of the brain um, are activated when we engage in the skill, when we are envisioning it. So um, as I always say, make it simple, the brain doesn't really know the difference between something being envisioned here and it's actually happening. Um, but one of the big things I, I talk about the science, I just was reading more about it, is um, the reticular activated uh, system so it, that determines, it's, it's filtering, and your brain cannot take in every single thing at all times. So it filters what's important. So what happens is, again, this goes back to those belief systems, is that it's uh, filtering what fits, those, what fits what it knows, basically. So basically, when you start to visualize and practice that, that system is now being trained to look for something new. It's starting to being trained to look for what you want. And that's why things will start to look different. And I will tell you, part of those uh, brain retraining programs was a ton of visualization. I got very sick of it. But um, I will tell you, I started that in 2015. And we are now in 2019. Every single one of those has happened. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you if you visualize like a yacht and $10 million. I don't know. That's not my thing. I, I, I can't promise that. But I visualized more, more things of what I really wanted out of life. And one of the things I learned, it didn't always look the way I exactly thought, it might come in a different way, and it also didn't come on my timeline. So some of that didn't come for two or three years, but it has all come to fruition, and that's why I think it's one of the most powerful skills, um, and that's why it's being talked about more and more and more and more. But what I noticed is, I didn't hear this talked about at all, once you start to really get to these trans, uh, transformative points, is, no, sorry, <laughs> Miss Daisy's transformation day. Um, so this was last year in, in, in Bogota, that was my first time in South America, and this was in 2014, this was at 90 pounds, so it wasn't my sickest point, but it was before I came home from Florida. And um, what I started to notice is even if you're coming out of an experience that's really painful and you're starting to change and transform into to the more positive, at first you're not going to really recognize who you are. And, and that nobody really told me about. So it was like because we are addicted to what we know, and also we start to produce, like our own thoughts produce certain chemicals at a certain point, so we're addicted to our thinking system, our beliefs, and that's what we've done forever, how many years. And so I will give you a very simple example, I was, and I was reading a psychologist talked about that, is you know it literally does become addicting because 
Those thoughts and beliefs create certain chemicals in the body. That is what we get used to. And all of a sudden, when those are changed and they're gone, that kind of like, uh, that chemical addiction is sort of gone as well. And nobody had told me that. I thought like, okay, well, you don't want to be here. And now you're here. And shouldn't that be like all happy, glorious, and like great? And it will be at a certain point. But at first, it's recognizing you're not going to recognize yourself at first. And, and I can tell you, you know, forget this part of the journey. I was somebody who had a lot of anxiety my whole life and how it would really manifest, not a typical way, but it would just manifest more. I'd overthink everything and I'd think everyone didn't like me and I would overthink every conversation and friends in here will tell you like, it's, get, it's not perfect, it's getting better. <laughs> and I remember the first time I walked away from something and it didn't make it about like, oh, this is about me and I did something wrong and where it was just like, okay, this has nothing to do with me. And I almost didn't recognize myself in that moment. I didn't, I didn't know, like, I was like, this isn't how I think. I've, I've thought this way for 27, well, let's say 27 years, because maybe you'd start thinking it too. And, and so I was almost like, what? And, and it almost felt like I was a little bit like, whoa, for a couple days. And I talked to my therapist about it, and she said, like, yeah, it's because you're breaking an addiction. And I almost was like, well, this is too simple. Like, people think like this, like, oh, that has nothing to do with me. And it, it seemed too simple. And, and I realized nobody really talks about that part of the stage. And, and so now I'm embracing it more and more and more, and it's becoming more natural habit. But when it first happened, and I had been working so hard for so many years to get to that point, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't recognize it. I didn't recognize myself. So it's really, really important to be able to step into the new who I am and recognizing it's going to feel very, very different. We are human beings. We like the same things over and over again. We like familiarity. We like comfort. That's what we're addicted to. And there's been studies on that, like people will tend to sit in the same exact chairs even if they're not assigned. Um, so it's really important. We're gonna do an activity of that at the end. So it's really important if you're creating like a new identity for yourself or stepping into to a new phase of life, uh, of making sure it's full of things that you feel really, really good about. And then one of the big things is balance and finding balance across the board. And we're going to do that with the activity. Um, and so the reason Miss Daisy's here, Miss Daisy had her own transformation. So she came from Arkansas a couple years ago and uh, she went through her own journey of abandonment. She was found running down a road covered in ticks and mats and terrified and, and, um, she, you know, and I also say life is a good reflection of, of where we're at. So I know a lot of times my clients will reflect somewhere I've been in my journey or where I'm at now. And Miss Daisy was very much a reflection of me. Um, she, I didn't like being alone and she would lose her mind being alone. And um, she had to learn to trust again and she had to learn how to get confidence again. And that was part of this. I had lost my entire sense of self from being so ill. Um, and I didn't know who I was. Um, and, and so part of the last few years has been building that. And that's why I love this picture. It was only a couple of months ago because I think she thinks she's modeling. Um, so I think it belongs on like Dog Vogue and, and I think she feels really good about herself with a little smile on. Um, and, so, and, and so but the fun part about Miss Daisy was um, my dad, when I was so sick, used to drive me around to the appointments. And a lot of times I'd be uh, either laying down in the back of the car or I'd have uh, when I'd have broken feet, they'd be up one length. And he'd be like, oh, okay, Miss Daisy, I'm driving Miss Daisy. Where are we going, Miss Daisy? And so it was this big joke, I'm driving Miss Daisy. And uh, when I started to feel well enough that I thought I was ready for a dog, I started the search, and none of them would pan out, or they wouldn't get back to me. And one day I'm searching for fun, and all of a sudden, I, I wanted a small dog too. I see this, hello, my name is Driving Miss Daisy. And I contacted my dad, and. And, and he said, that dog is a, I think he called it an omen. I think he meant a sign. And um, it was, I emailed them. I got a response within two hours. And, and Miss Daisy was in my arms three weeks later. And um, so she's been part of, she's been a huge part of my journey. She would go out on walks as I was learning to walk more. When I'm not feeling well, she's on my bed the entire time. She goes to doctor's appointments. She, my clients know her. The, so I do a lot of uh, webcam and she's, always around and uh, she brings a lot of people joy. But um, So the activity, if anybody wants to meet her after, but the activity we're gonna do, now I don't wanna get sued, um, I'm allowed to use it, but this is from my coaching program. This is called the circle of life. And so if you guys have this piece of paper, you don't need it, you can also do it. What, they, what we do 
is you put, so if it's lacking, you go towards the inner circle. And if it's more of your strong area, you go towards the outer. And so what you do is so you put a little mark. Maybe you have one. In spirituality, people get into religion. You know, it can be religion. It can be full-blown religion. Spirituality can be as simple as nature grounds me. Nature makes me happy. Or I kind of believe at some point, you know, a lot of people will say, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That is still having some form of spirituality. Okay, so ra, so ra. What will be, will be. So, you know, if it doesn't, you know, just because you're not worshiping in a church, if you feel it's still balanced, Totally fine. Lord, can you just explain it again? Yeah. So, if you feel the, you know, this area, you're very satisfied with the area, you feel it's going very, very well, just assume the dot's on the very tip of the outer circle. Outer. Outer. So, like, if, if you were in perfect health, so your circle of life looked great, you just have a full circle. Share um, where maybe their biggest lacking point is. Yes. Relationships. Relationships. Okay. So, what's something you might be able to do to strengthen that area of your life? Um, take a risk. Take a risk. I like that. That's a good answer. Take a risk. Who else wants to share? Yes. Uh, we entered together. Creativity, um, and I think people are focusing more and more on the importance of that. Um, so I could say for the majority of people, we have like adult coloring books out now, and I know it sounds really corny, but they're actually really therapeutic if you just spend five minutes coloring in them. Um, they, a lot of them have uh, mandalas, which are very, very therapeutic. So 45 minutes of art can actually lower cortisol levels significantly, and that's your stress hormone. Um, there's also paint nights for women, I mean, women and men can go, but. Uh, anybody can go, but paint nights, um, and then creativity can be all sorts of, you know, for, who, who has examples, who felt their creativity was strong? Okay, who wants to share? Mom, why don't you share? Oh. Well, I have a chance to be creative in my work, so that's almost every day. Every day. So she does interior design. Um, who else wants to share their I had a bunch of hands up. What happened? <laughs> yes. I'm a landscape designer. Landscape designer. Okay, that's perfect. Wow, that's awesome. What else? Yes. I have a lot of creativity, but I work so hard I don't get to do enough. So I would have put my abilities at extra level, but I would have put my time to do it for your end. Do you feel your music can count as the creativity? It was part of it, but it's not. It's you feel like it's so, yeah? Yes. Um, I'm a sculptor, but I can't do it now. Okay. <laughs> Just by, uh, your hands. The hands. Have you found something that you can replace that with? Um, no. I may be able to do it again. But, okay. Uh, yeah, not really. Not yet. So that's, that's sometimes too, is, is being flexible with, I know for example, okay, when I started, uh, before all this, I never did art. I actually brought my art sketchbook. And I was like, I can't do art. And, and so I've learned, I took this creative art class and it was about just doing art for the process, not the product. Now I do it all the time. If I got five minutes, I take out pastels and I don't think and I just make. And it was that I always thought creative, like, oh, I have to be Picasso and, and paint portraits. Um, so it, it's learning to be flexible. Creativity can be gardening, um, designing a social, uh, I don't want to say social media, but designing page, you know, websites. I know when I made mine, I, it was one of, my creative juices were flowing. Um, anybody else have something unique for creativity? Cooking. Cooking, that's an awesome one. That is creativity. That's creating in the kitchen. Picture taking. Picture taking in tree trunks and finding faces, yeah, absolutely, and leaves, and just yeah. 
And the one, the one plus to these new smartphones, you know, there's some takeaways, but anybody can really take some beautiful pictures now, and that's what's amazing. All right, what's another, who's got another strong area? Physical activity. Physical activity. What do you do for physical activity? Run. Anybody else have that as a strong one? What did he say? Physical activity? <laughs> he runs. Oh. Oh, you're on physical activity. Sorry. You can't hear everything back here. Sorry. We're asking who else has a strong pie slice? Work out at the gym. Work out at the gym. You walk, you ride your bike, is it? Swim. Triathlon. Yes. I'm a gardener for pies, so I'm always moving things and digging things. Definitely. Did you read, um, there's a study out that the soil has uh, things that work like, uh, the organisms in it work like an antidepressant? Uh, it's, it's extremely <laughs> grounding and satisfying. So, yeah, I, I would believe that. Anybody else want to share a strong point or a point they feel they definitely should work on looking at this chart? I think a strong point is finances right now because our kids are out of the house. Yeah. We're not retired. <laughs> You know, kind of like pass the gracers and all that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Well, physical activity is um, go to ways. For example, you may play something that you really like, like pickleball, say. Yep. Or else you may put yourself through going on the elliptical and things like that. But it really isn't that much fun. Right. But if you don't do it, <laughs> you feel good after you do it. <laughs> but that's what, so, you know, it's nice to be able to combine some of them, like joy and physical activity. Can you find a physical activity that brings you joy? Can you find a physical activity that's creative, like gardening? So that's what some of it is. It's being flexible, too. It's being flexible and finding balance. Um, and also understanding ebb and flow of life. At different points in life, there's going to be different strengths in these pie slices and weaknesses. Some of that's inevitable and beyond our control. And at that point, then we focus on what are the things we can do at that point. Um, and I honestly, I had forgotten kind of about our pie chart when we were taught about this, and then I realized how important this pie chart is because as people are going through their, their healing and transformation process, all, all of this starts to come back into play. It's like, okay, what do I want to make changes in my career so I'm happier? Or I really want to get back to art. I've forgotten about it. Or I really want to start some, you know, restore, even if it's restorative yoga, whatever it might be. Um, anybody else want to share any of them? Does anybody look at your chart and say, okay, I definitely need to make a change somewhere? Do you feel you can make that change? Even if it's baby steps. And then that, if everything falls kind of between the center and the outside. No, you have that perfect circle, but you know you're not that center where everything's going. You know, on everything. Yeah, they say, I, somebody, did somebody say that's progress? I love that quote. <laughs> it's not about perfection. I mean, I don't think anybody in here, I'd be very concerned if somebody had a perfect circle. I don't think I'd believe you, to be honest. <laughs> I, just, I settled for a scribble where something's actually on the outside. I like that. Perfect. So it's, Perfection is really rigidity. It is perfection. I like that quote too. Perfection is rigidity. I would also say perfection is trying to control. And that's, like I said, an illusion. So I think the very, very last point is whenever you're going, I don't have any more slides, but <laughs> whatever you're going through, one of the greatest gifts that you can walk away with is, is making meaning out of it. And what I will tell you, and that's where I bring back the spiritual bypass, please don't try, if you're going through a tough point in life, please don't try to do that in the beginning. I remember somebody tried to do, and I had just fallen off a scooter, somebody's like, well, something will come out of that. I did not need to hear that at that moment. <laughs> But I was willing to say that within a few weeks. Oh yeah, something came out of it. I said, the universe intervened and basically said, okay, if you're not gonna slow down 
we'll knock you off your scooter and knock out your other leg and you'll really understand what slow down means. <clears throat> Uh, but I, you know, and it took time. I had to have my emotions. I was shaken up at first. I was upset. Then I was angry. And then as I settled into the accepting what is, over time I started to realize the meaning of that. And I said, it would have been crazy to walk around Spain. I, I have not been very mobile. I think I would have been pushed around in a wheelchair in reality the whole time. I, I just, and it's also going to be 110 in Sevilla in July. Um, so stuff did come out of it. And then changing to part time, I realized, Thank God I did that because my uh, mom and I were actually laughing hysterically. I would have been starting my um, intern, what's that thing? Orientation. And uh, I'm only just starting physical therapy right now. So it's um, being able, you know, the meaning can be as simple as this made me into the person I am today. It can simply be I don't want to live that again, but I learned and healed from it. That can be meaning. It can say, you know, I can tell you this whole experience, would I really want to relive it? Absolutely not. But it's transformed my journey. It's changed my career path. It's changed where I lived. It's changed my priorities. It's changed my spirituality. I have this dog because of that. I don't know. I would have been working full time. I don't know if I would have had time for a rescue dog and I probably would have been living in New York City. So it's, it's you know, and um, I, one of my classmates is in here. We did a presentation for group counseling. There's something called logo therapy. Victor Frankl, if anybody's ran, uh, read a man's search for meaning. Yep. The best book ever, yes. Awesome. And um, it was funny, when we learned about it in, in my program, I didn't know about him and I didn't know what it was, but I realized like that had been such a big part of my journey is, is to make meaning. And that's part of also learning what you can do in the present moment. So when I was super sick, my meaning was watching birds, doing a little bit of painting. Um, are in the small, small things. And I, I still take that to this day. When I was driving, I haven't driven, very, I only started driving last week, and when I was driving up here on the highway, I was, I saw a bird. I saw the trees, and it was like seeing life in a whole other way. And so that is the biggest thing, but I will tell you, please let yourself go through the journey before you try to make meaning. Don't, on day one, if life has gone to shit, don't try to say, oh, well, I'm gonna make meaning out of this. And I call that spiritual bypassing, because it's skipping the, the processing of the emotions and Yes. A note on the color wheel, I don't know what your interpretation was on it, but it appears that some of the colors are a reflection of some of the chakras if you I like that. that I like the that. interpretation of the purples and the different ones with your chakras. I love that. So again, I don't want to get sued. Our our coaching program makes this, it's called the circle of life. We are allowed to use it, but they are, they definitely, they're big into mind, body, and spirit. And then one of the things they, they teach is, is having balance in life because you can eat all the kale and broccoli you want in the world. And if your lifestyle is balanced, it's not gonna make it, I don't wanna say it's not gonna make no difference, but it, it's not gonna make much of a difference. What you eat is more than just what you put in your body. How you feed and nourish yourself is more than just physical food. So yes, I, would, I, I wouldn't doubt if they had it lined up a little bit with the, the chakra radius, because they talk about a lot of energy stuff too. Well, the joy and the dark yep. eyes, so for, the, for anybody who doesn't know, like chakras, the, the red would be your root, and you'd be working your way up towards the top. Is that the chakra? Is the purple? Uh, I want to mention too that um, sometimes when you're going through things, like you were talking about finding the meaning, and it, if you can't find the meaning, because I think you're a perfect example of somebody too that um, you can take what you've gone through and it can be a message for somebody else. I, I remember watching Good Morning America years ago when Robin Roberts was going through cancer and she uh, did, you know, followed her whole journey through it and then reported on it later and she said how her mother used to tell her, make your mess your message, you know, because share it with somebody else. I think it helps you by the sharing that you never know who you're going to touch. And I think that's exactly what you've done also with everything you've gone through. You've had such a wonderful message. I will say uh, rehab was probably one of the toughest parts of that journey. And um, that psychiatrist, we became good friends in there basically. And, and she said to me, you're going to help a lot of people one day. And that's how she would try to get me through every single day in there. And, um, and she'd joke around with me too, and she'd say, you know, if you want to get out of here, I'd start playing the game, and uh, and, um, and I did. And I, once I started eating, I never looked back and said, I'm getting the hell out of here. Um, 
But I, I remember you when I, I came out and, and my mother said like, you you will have learned a lot from that, you know, and, and being in there, and you will experience people in a different way. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I, I, please, we're on question time now, ask anything. Okay. Did you ever find that as you were starting to change and, and changing your shifting perspective that there were people outside of you that wanted to keep you where you were and any pushback? Definitely. I say, so like, um, I'm going to take, so most of my clients do have chronic illnesses. I'm going to use that example. Most of them, one of the painful parts is they have to start to leave that kind of community behind. Some of them, they have to kind of see you surrounded by the people, for example, that are focused on healing and moving forward. Um, just like anything in life, there are people who kind of want to stay stuck. Um, and it's not even, might not even mean conscious thing. And that is one of the things, is, is realizing too, you don't know somebody's journey. Um, so even if you really, you, they could be so self-destructive, and you know, and it's just the most painful thing to watch, but you can't just pull somebody out of that. It's their own journey. And so I struggle with that. Of like, I want to take everybody with me <laughs> as I start progressing. And, it's been, I'm somebody who like, I'm loyal to a T, I'm a Taurus, everybody. And so I'm a loyal and, and I always want everybody to come with me and not everybody is at that point in their journey. So that's a very good observation you made in a question. And, and I think it's, it is scary. A lot of times if they're, you're coming through major transformation, I know people who have uh, been in recovery from major addictions, they had to leave the majority of their old life behind. And there are very few friends who were able to go forward with them, very, very few. Yes. Wait, wait. I did that to you, but I told you about it. When you were trying to take care of me, and yep. I had always taken care of you, not just when you were sick, because I don't know, people who don't know, I used to take care of you. Laura, she was a teenager. Um, but when I went to her one time, and she reached out and tried to take care of me, what are you doing? <laughs> And that's, that's what, this recent journey how Tina said finding me, I didn't know what this summer was about. I, I wasn't particularly, I mean, my summer did not go according to plan. And I realized this theme of accepting help was really what came out of it and realized how many people, it was one of my most popular posts I'd ever done. And like normally it reached people that, you know, aren't dealing with illness or anything like that. And it, it was like this theme, universal theme, it's extremely hard to accept help. Yes. Would you say, um, oh, sorry. Spirituality might be um, the same thing as um, acceptance, in a way. Um, what do you, uh, would you say that, how would you define spirituality here? So for my, my view of spirituality, that it's surrender concept, it, it is a, a faith. I, I will tell you, my spirituality has gone all over the place. I was very new age for a while, and I still like some of it. Um, I was I grew up Catholic, kind of left that behind. Then I got very new age. Then last summer I was going through a tough time. I was walking in church, I, I, and I would listen to the messages that resonated, because I started to really my belief, and that's my personal belief. A lot of religions have the same core message. Um, there's a very similar core message across the board, and um, and so now my spirituality is much more loose again. But it, it is it's sort of that. I don't know what I'm trusting, but it's just trusting like life, you might want to say. Sometimes I say, like, I, I kind of feel like, um, I'll use maybe the word, angels people think of like these flapping things. I don't necessarily think of it like that way, but like I am surrounded by love, basically. I'm surrounded by something bigger than me. And it's trusting like, basically that has my back. And it's like, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be in pain. And I think people get confused if you're spiritual. That means like somehow you don't have, you don't go through pain, you don't go through suffering, and nothing bad happens in life. And I don't know where that comes from. It's more understanding like even in those times, I'm still somebody's got my back. Something bigger than me has my back. And it's like and so for me that spirituality was when I the surrender when I said I don't know what's going to come out of this, but something will. And I didn't know, and I didn't really know. It's like so I'm turning it over to something. Does that make sense? I think everyone's spirituality is different. I think there's a lot of people, they say go out, they go out in nature, and that has that same feeling of just, there's something greater than me. And that's still a form of spirituality. So it's so funny how we get very afraid of that word. Or somebody will tell me they're not spiritual, but they'll say, okay, life has a bigger plan for you. That's still a spiritual concept. So spirit, spiritual is bigger than religion, really. Because, um, 
lot of problems occur among religions. And the problem is, you know, religious, we become dogmatic sometimes. We can be dogmatic about anything in life. And I always find that amazing when religions are fighting, when you look at their primary tenet, it's sort of this return to love. And then when everybody's fighting about whose idea is better. You're in the back. I just wanted to um, clarify in my own head, you were talking about these different illnesses or, or, or different symptoms that you have. You mentioned um, chronic fatigue. It sounded like you also had some sort of autoimmune um, issue. So I'm just curious, did they ever figure out what it was? diagnoses, I would say I'm down to maybe two or three at this point. Um, and so... I'm not to say it again, please. Sorry, so... Diagnoses. Yes. Okay, got it. Um, so I didn't really... So I still carry the chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis. It's also known in Europe as myalgic encephalitis. It's, there's big political discussion. Um, and when I was diagnosed with that, like you said, I thought it was just meant like, oh, I'm tired. I didn't realize it was its own illness. It has its own set of things. And one of the things is it's this thing called post-exertional malaise. And so post-exertion, whether it's physical or mental, within 24 to 48 hours, you get these flu-like symptoms. And so that still affects me today. My, my threshold's much, much higher. Um, but when I was at my sickest point, that exertion level was cutting my food with a fork and knife. And it would leave me debilitated the next day. Um, and so I have done so many different treatments and I did have some chronic infections um, for people who have dealt with like tick-borne stuff. I did carry a tick-borne illness. I never really got attached to that label. Um, so I did treat that. And then um, I have been like right now, I'm on an antiviral drug with an anti-inflammatory. So this illness, it's all guesswork. Even today, five years later, there are no FDA approved treatments. Um, and I've got this great internist. There's so many people to think in here, but. I have this great internist who's willing to just, I bring a study and we say, let's try it. And um, it's a lot of guinea pig stuff. Um, but I also did what I talked about, those, those neuroplasticity programs. Um, just so you know, I do, yes, I have an autoimmune in my thyroid. I don't know how much of a role that plays. My, my family has autoimmune. It's all over my family. So they don't know if chronic fatigue syndrome is an autoimmune illness. It definitely is, it affects the immune system greatly. Um, I have a very weak immune system still, so. Um, and then I do, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis and that's the one we don't know what's going on there. And the endocrine piece, we don't really know. I take hormone replacement. Um, what about MS? MS, I, my MRIs are clear. Um, but yes, I, it can mimic, they definitely, they have, they have similar things. One of the really hallmark symptoms is that post-exertional malaise part which is very hallmark to chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's a lot of, you know, fatigue is a hallmark symptom of any autoimmune illness. But in this, it's uh, when you overexert, it's like you have flu-like symptoms, basically. It feels like I got the flu all over again. Um, and so again, like my threshold for that's much higher to cause that. But you know, when I'm sicker, it's much lower. Um, and it's tough, it can also be even mental exertion. So uh, my classmates will tell you, I, I get up constantly out of class and I have to go take breaks and, and stuff like that, so. Um, but I did bring, books on um, some of the books I thought were really helpful um, for, for learning about this stuff was uh, for anybody. The Brain's Way of Healing by Norman Deutsch really taught me about neuroplasticity and the brain's ability to change. So what's cool about this book is there's case studies of all sorts of physical illnesses, learning disabilities. Um, so there's, there's Parkinson's in here, there's chronic pain in here, ADD's in here. Um, even like, I, it was either deafness or blindness, I don't remember which one, and they use all different therapy, every case uses different therapies that work with neuroplasticity. Um, and so it's, it really, this was a game changer. <laughs> oh, she'll jump. <laughs> she's like a cat, she jumps all over. <laughs> uh, but, she's, oh, were you gonna slip? Um, and so, this really opened my eyes in the ability for the brain to, to change. Um, you know, you can use different therapies in, in a way that will help basically. So 
neuroplastic changes can benefit us if we use them the right way. Um, so this was a really good game changer. I really recommend, I met this man at a conference, I really recommend this book. Another one I didn't bring, it was too big, it's called Unlearn Your Pain um, by Howard Schubiner, who's an MD who has an interest in chronic pain and neuroplasticity, and he works with a lot of people with medically unexplained symptoms, and I will tell you a lot of my chronic pain conditions, yes, there were other treatments that helped. Acupuncture, I have my, um, Tim Trahan's a really great acupuncturist, everybody, and he's in Clinton, he's, in, can you raise your hand? <laughs> and, um, but, I used a lot of those methods and most of those chronic pain conditions I consider pretty much in remission. I don't even think about most of them. Um, so that's a workbook too. I use that a lot with clients, uh, but you can do that at home. So that's called Unlearn Your Pain. You can find that on Amazon. Um, he also has Unlearn Your Depression and Anxiety. Um, but I'm a big proponent if that if your depression and anxiety are very severe, make, make sure it's you're under the right care. Um, Howard Schubiner. Um, he also wrote The Brain That Changes Itself. That was his first book. This was the newer book. The Brain's Way of Healing. Um, and so there's different people. They have chronic pain, they used a lot of visualization. This was somebody who was debilitated after a car accident. Um, one of the illnesses used something called Feldenkrais, which is move, it's body movement and it helps rewire the brain, remap the brain. I went to his conference and the case study um, helped somebody with cerebral palsy who was told that she's gonna be an invalid for life and at the end of the clip, she was getting married on her wedding day. It was a beautiful story. Um, there's, there's all different therapies in here and, and it's really cutting edge. Um, he's kind of the first to say all this stuff that was thought to be kind of, I wanna say a death sentence, not literally, but sort of like you're stuck with it for life. It's, he wants to turn that kind of on its head. Um, and then this I learned just more about the power of visualization, um, some of the science behind it, not just the, so you know, it's, it's big in the spiritual world as well, but just more the science behind it too. So that's called creative visualization, but you can read plenty about visualization online. And for people with creativity, like I can tell you, I grabbed myself like one of these, especially this summer I've been homeless, so anytime I'm just sitting there kind of bored and I just got pastels, it was $5 in total, and I just like, I, I just go and I don't think and I've made all sorts of things, and so that's how it's easy to really start getting into creativity. Any other questions? 